Welcome back. It is my pleasure, my great pleasure now, to introduce our dear colleague, Sarah Grosso. Sarah is a member of the Webster University faculty, a researcher, and a lead professor. She also leads the MA in Communications Management and is an independent consultant, gender, research, and communication. So Sarah, we welcome you and your panel. Thank you so much. Thanks ever so much, Mary Thelma. It's my great pleasure to um, moderate this panel, um, second panel, which is on the theme of feminism and identity politics, uh, the rise of new social movements. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to thank everybody who's been involved in making this conference possible and to all the contributors so far for their uh, rich contributions. Uh, I know that one of the things we had in mind when we started talking about this event was that we really wanted to listen to scholars and activists from the region. So it's been a, a real pleasure to do that this morning. Um, this panel um, builds on, I think, some of the comments made by uh, Professor Asada in her uh, enlightening keynote presentation, um, where she mentioned how women's rights and feminist movements must be understood within the broader political and cultural context and can easily be entangled with struggles surrounding cultural identity and the relationship with the Imperial West. Um, and I, this is something I certainly found to be true during my own research in Tunisia under Ben Ali's regime, where the perceptions of those personal status laws that were mentioned, that are often mentioned in fact as being particularly progressive in the region, uh, were varied and where those perceptions also affected the extent to which women were able to access their rights given to them within those laws. Um, so this is a really important topic. Uh, we're going to have uh, two presentations. Um, unfortunately, one of our speakers who's from Tunisia, Haule Xixi, is unable to join us today. Uh, Haule is the co-founder of the Collective Voices of Tunisian Black Women. Unfortunately, she's unwell and she won't be joining us. So. Um, Paula, wherever you are, we all wish you a very speedy and full recovery. Um, therefore, we'll have two speakers um, and then we'll have the opportunity to have a discussion. I'm delighted to say that two further participants will be joining the Q&A. Uh, we'll welcome back Professor Hode Sade, who will be able to answer your questions that I'm sure you have following her um, deep insights in her keynote presentation. Um, the second participant who will be joining the Q&A in a moment will be Ali Mary Tripp, who is a Wangari Mati Professor of Political Science and Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, her research is focused on women and politics and women's movements in Africa, including the Maghreb. Uh, so she'll be able to join us for that discussion later. Uh, before then, we'll enjoy two presentations. Uh, the first will be from a voice we've already heard in the discussion earlier, um, Hibak Osman El Karama, who is the founder of El Karama, a MENA NGO that works to end violence against women and to deliver sustainable, inclusive peace and democracy in Africa and the Middle East. Um, she's, her work is incredibly varied, including in her homeland of Somalia. Uh, and more recently, she's also been working to support grassroots women's activists to build constituencies and secure their rights in the wake of the Arab Revolution. Uh, so Hibak, I'll leave you the floor for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be with you today looking back at the revolutions of 10 years ago. Whenever you are asked to reflect on the legacy of a revolution, it's hard not to think of the words of the Chinese Prime Minister, Zhu Lai. One asked in 1972 about the significance of the French Revolution, he replied that it was too early to say. He may well have been thinking about, uh, about thinking about the protesters of 1968, but in his words are a lesson for us when looking back at momentous events, especially those we lived through. Um, so um, what can we definitively say about revolutions uh, apart from what felt unthinkable at the time. 10 years later, no one 
would seriously suggest that they delivered on their promise. To have experienced the revolutions at the time, um, uh, I'm having trouble with the, with the internet. Uh, to have experienced the revolutions at the time was truly extraordinary. To see the pictures of the crowds gathering on Avenue Habib al Bulqaiba in Tunis took your breath away. To be in Tahrir Square in Cairo, to feel the energy of, um, to feel the energy of, uh, of the people in Tahrir Square was also taking your breath away. Uh, and you felt anything was possible. That hope was tempered by realism. Women especially did not walk out into the, those streets blindly. Women truly knew the challenges that they faced in trying to bring change. They knew how strong the resistance would be within and without our societies. They knew that it would be women who faced the first and most ferocious backlash. Perhaps most of all, women activists recognize that the people's anger alone would not lead to a better society. Activists knew of the importance of an organized and established civil society. We can see evidence of this in the country, which arguably fared better than other through the revolutions, Tunis. Uh, Tunisia, even that notion, however, would be deeply contested by Tunisians. They would emphasize that their country continues to feel on the brink of collapse. The problem that made revolution feel inevitable are still endemic. Inequality, corruption, food price inflation, an economy that was uh, fluttering even before COVID-19. It is an indictment of the revolutions that despite all this, Tunisia is still in a better position than many countries in the other countries in the region. So why was Tunisia better equipped, though not exactly well equipped to navigate the currents of the revolution? It's because they had a better developed and well-established civil society. It was through the existence and determination and leadership of groups like the Tunisian National Dialogue Quartet that the difficult post-revolution process did not collapse entirely. In societies left hollow out by other authoritarians and dictators, the speed of revolutions left little or no time for the essential work of building constituents and nurturing leaders with credibility and confidence. That has been one of the most significant barriers to women in particular, realizing the potential of the revolutions. In a situation where women are already discriminated under the law, where they are politically marginalized and where there has been little social and political space for discussion for the women's agenda. Women have even ground to make, more ground to make up. From Tunis, from Tunisia in 2010 to Sudan in 2019, women's movements and women's participation has been central to the revolutions we have seen. The problem has been that as, as soon as the revolutions turn from mass movements to political, uh, processes, more established political forces assert themselves, and that's when we see women pushed aside. They really become the casual, the first political casualty. This is exactly what has ha been happening in Sudan. Women were at the forefront of the revolution uprising. Reports say that women made up the majority of the protesters, as much as 70%. They became the icons of the revolution. Their pictures share across the globe in social media but the political establishment was happy for women to simply be figureheads of the revolution and not the leaders of the change they demanded. Women's participation in the transition has been far from the parity they demanded. It's the same story. Women find equality in the streets, but the inequality returns as soon as the movement disperses. An underdeveloped society, an underdeveloped uh, civil society stunned through restrictions and lack of support leaves a vacuum where progressive voices would be able to participate in. Transitions uh, provide support system to guide societies through uncertainty. However, the people who were prepared for the vacuum and the uncertainty of the revolutions were the Islamists. They were ready and willing to take full advantage either at the ballot box or with forced arms. Their intention has not been simply to roll back any advances women were able to grasp through the revolutions, but to turn the clock back even further. And their methods were calculated and insidious. In Egypt, Husni Mubarak's wife, Susan Mubarak, had taken the cause of women's rights as her own 
at the Beijing World Conference in 1995. It was Susan Mubarak who had led Egypt's delegation, though only as a figurehead. And it was she who had publicly lobbied for women's political quotas and reforms to the force law. So when uh, Husni Mubarak was ultimately forced out, the issue of women's rights was closely associated by many people with this regime. Dedicated women's rights defenders and advocates were tarred by this association. Conservatives were keen to promote in the public mind a few that demands for women's political participation were mass calls for return to the old regime. We see here the twin problems at work, a hallowed out civil society in which the elite plays the role without building sustainable support, and secondly, establish an organized force of regression. This is not to say that women's movements were starting from zero. Even in countries that had in effect outlawed civil society, such as Libya, there were prominent and capable women with a vision for equality and democracy. But building a national consensus during a crisis is a difficult task for governments, let alone organizations whose first struggle is simply for sustainability. It was our experience that the revolutions did see an increase in the willingness of women's groups to work together. The opportunity presented by the revolutions fostered greater collaboration and cooperation prior to this, there was more competition and rivalry. These were, to an extent, set aside with people prepared to unify their vision and work to, towards it. Where women's groups were able to innovate, they have been able to shine. The digital space proved to be a very significant point of entry for young people into the political space. Women were able to organize and build truly remarkable platforms. Social media was an important tool for protest. Though not in itself a serious pillar of the revolutions, but its utility is now greatly diminished and even gone into reverse. Just as male violence drove women off the streets and into the margins, online platforms have become another means through which women activists are harassed, defamed, and attacked. I do not want to preempt anything in the next discussion on social media, but I would like to say that this situation is particularly acute in countries that are experiencing conflict. It's not simply a cliche to say that social media has become another battlefield. Militias are deployed to attack online as a key part of their overall tactics and, uh, and strategy. Social media has become more dangerous place for women and girls, something that has become more prominent during the current pandemic. Thanks to COVID-19, those of us who are able to, re uh, to rely uh, to reliably connect now, do everything we can online. It has meant we have been able to approximate much of the, our work, but it has also exposed the limitations of technology. Not only are we subject to a regulatory wasteland where our data and access are at the mercy of big corporations, but online work is an adjacent to activism and not to substitute. Though it is significant for organizing and mobilizing um, Though its significance for organizing and mobilizing are questionable, we still see how important traditional media and social media can be for inspiring in a fast scale. Global social medias are still able to give voice to those who have been politically marginalized. Black Lives Matter emerged from a very particular and very local issues. It quickly transcended them to become a call to action globally to address, to end, so uh, racial injustice and inequality. It is a movement that we in North Africa and the Middle East especially need to pay heed to. We have all been outraged by the murders of George Floyd, Bronnie uh, uh, Taylor, Eric Garner, and so many more in the United States. We are all disgusted by the brutal attack on the musician producer, Michel Sackler by police in France. We see racism bled the lives of black and brown people across North America and Europe. But we must recognize and actively work to end anti-black racism in this region. We need to dismantle the systems of oppression that led to appalling treatment of refugees and migrants moving through North Africa. The abuse of domestic workers and the everyday discrimination and marginalization experienced by black people across the region. This urgently needs to be national agenda across North Africa and the Middle East. There are 
more global policies and attitudes that we must address. I, I explored earlier the internal forces that confronted women's movements in the revolution, but they were not the only enemies of justice and equality. For all that many international governments wish to emphasize their commitment to democracy, it is a fact that foreign influence and interventions throughout the last decade have been misguided, misconceived, and entirely disastrous for the people of the region. I only imagine the world we might be in had the billions spent on military aid being instead invested in education, sustainable economics, and trying to prevent climate disaster. It is fair to ask why international governments save their most ardent support for warlords and dictators rather than those with a hope of building more uh, democratic and equal society. The immediate post-colonial era was drenched in the blood of African Democrats murdered at the hands of the retreating colonial powers. Equally, foreign governments conspired with, in, uh, with uh, uh, authoritarian era that led to December 2010, protecting institutions whose facades and corruption were supported by the international community. The Arab revolutions were bloody, especially so for women and for few for new generation of activists in jail, in exile, in the grave. When we ask the question, why did the revolutions fail? Let us not forget that there are answers to be found here in Europe, as well as in North uh, Africa and the Middle East. At this time, we should not forget the moment we identified as the start of the, of the revolutions. A man trying to make a decent living was so desperate, so frustrated by corruption at once both petty and all consuming that he saw no future for himself. The problem, one that in this today, in, in, in this day has not been solved is that people recognize it themselves in Muhammad Aziz, Muhammad Aziz's uh, despair. That is why his death stirred millions of people. Too many, um, too many of the same problems are uh, apparent in the lives of people, and um, uh, too many too many of the same problems are apparent in the lives of people across the region. Does that mean we are still living through the revolutions? Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much, Hibak, for that passionate well, I, yeah just the last thing i just would you yeah. know if i can go return to uh, you know if i in conclusion i can only return to what shun lai said it is too early to say anything at this point thank you okay thank you ever so much um for an extremely passionate presentation um i really enjoyed it but we'll hold off a moment asking you questions first of all we'll listen to our second speaker um, Asma Khalifa, who's a Libyan activist and researcher. Uh, she's been working on peace building in Libya. And in 2016, she was awarded the Luxembourg Peace Prize during the World Peace Forum, and has also been named one of the 100 most influential young Africans. Uh, she's currently working on her PhD at the German Institute for Global Area Studies in Hamburg on the impact of the civil war on intergender relations. Um, so Asma, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and, uh, and building on Hipak's great uh, presentation, um, I will um, make the case that the work um, for uprisings and revolutions is indeed continuous um, until we have um, achieved a, a transformation. I will address the importance of equity and solidarity within the feminist movements uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. And uh, while I try to give the background for um, examples from Libya and Syria for the Amazigh women and the Kurdish women, I would like to highlight that this applies to black women, uh, women from different from other ethnic groups, uh, indigenous women, women under occupation, both Palestine and Western Sahara, because I think that's very important to um, bring always to the to the light so uh, i don't want to um repeat what has been said about how the revolutions and the social movements in 2011 um and have managed to squeeze in a space uh, that brought forward a lot of grievances 
um, including uh, the rights uh, of indigenous uh, people and ethnic groups. And um, it wasn't much of an emergence because the struggle was, um, I believe, much like between the Amazigh and the Kurdish uh, from the 60s, 70s in response to the post-colonial governments that were in place, um, who very much had the popularist rhetoric uh, of Arab nationalism, which marginalized and sidelined all other identities that do not, are not Arab um, and Muslim. So uh, um, what the, the, the women, the Amazigh women, uh, for instance, in, uh, in, in Libya more specifically, we, um, emerged um, as part of a political uh, uh, struggle and not more of of the linguistic um, rights that has been uh, that has been around and that's because um, it wasn't it was for us it was confounding that uh, women's rights uh, are are just re uh, being related and put in context of women's problems because every problem, every social issue, every political issue is a woman's issue um, and is a woman's rights struggle. So we, uh, I remember we organized in 2015 uh, for women to, to meet and elect themselves for the Amazigh Supreme Council, which is an indigenous uh, entity that was elected by the, 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 the Amazigh people. And from there, we try to work also um, with the women in local governance, trying to bring in their perspective uh, to try to strengthen their gender agenda, but also to bring in that their, their sp very specific uh, experiences as indigenous women need to be reflected in policies and in response programs um, to women. What, what I think we failed to do very much is to connect more regionally with, uh, with our sisters in Algeria and Morocco and Tunisia. And that comes as various reasons, because um, while the, the, the movements very much struggle, I mean, there's still uh, there's been the Hirak in Morocco. Um, there's still sometimes um, conflicts in Tizi Wizi in, in, in Algeria. Um, but what 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 continues to be is actually structures put in place by governments and regimes, not only in North Africa, but also in the Middle East to divide the populations um while also uniting them behind an, an arab nationalist identity so divide them politically and socially um to build up solidarities whether by putting visas or closing borders or having conflicts um so it wasn't it's not easy to meet other activists it's not easy to, co to connect and of course there's no funding in place for um a lot of the a lot of um a lot of the indigenous people's uh, issues um there is a lack of recognition not only in North Africa but also internationally, uh, because um, as Hibak has said, because West, West, uh, some Western governments and other governments are making friends with stable dictatorships and stable uh, authoritarian regimes, and bringing issues of indigenous people or ethnic groups in particular or black people is very sensitive. Um, to, to such governments, while the Kurdish women, for instance, uh, were much more successful in their solidarity and transnational um, connections, because when the Kurdish organizations couldn't work in Syria because of the invasion of Turkey, they were able to operate in Iraq. If they weren't able to operate in Turkey, they'll be operated uh, in, in, in the Kurdish region. So it's the transnational aspect has made activism act much more impactful and successful and has connected uh, more resources and that move that makes me move to the to the other to, to my next point which is that the feminist agenda in MENA has to be transnational our issues are connected our conflicts are connected our wars are, are connected there is no way that um that the war in Libya the war in Yemen is is only influenced by Libyans. There's the, the Emiratis involved, the Saudis are involved, the Turks are involved. Uh, we have we are surrounded by neighbors, the Egyptians, the Tunisians. So it's it's um, to me it's important that the, all the feminist movements of all these countries come in around and to support the women's struggle um, on various on various agendas. I'm, I'm bringing war as as an example, but it could be very uh, in, in other issues. There is a, unfortunately not a lack of issues in the, in the in the region. The 
there's movements, the feminist movements also have to recognize that the political and social struggles of for equality are not just rooted in social norms and patriarchal cultural cultural practices, but they're also put in structures and systems, meaning we can't participate as another colleague I think have highlighted, I can't, we can't participate in governments and, and in, in, um, in electing bodies that continue to marginalize um, black people, that continue to marginalize indigenous people, that continue to, um, to marginalize all other groups um, that, that, um, that are oppressed. So we have to, um, it has to transcend, so to speak, um, uh, a lot of, of a lot of limitations and issues. Um, and that's a challenge because uh, there is a lack of acknowledgement, as Hibak has said, in, in, in the Middle East and North Africa of racism, even in, within our communities. And it is large, it's, quite, it's pretty big, it's a big, big issues, but it is seen as a Western uh, issue, more, more concise, it's seen as an American issue, which is ex extremely um, uh, problematic because um, if slavery is only seen as, as an American issue, there's a lack of acknowledgement then of the entire occupation of North Africa, the slave, um, his, the slavery history of North Africa. I mean, it's it's incredible, and it still impacts today the issues of migration, of refugees, the uh, abduction, the human trafficking that happens across North Africa um, and Sub-Sahara. These big, massive networks, the dehumanization of migrants, of black people. Um, in in, uh, in in all of these countries, um, and and um, unfortunately, our colleague from Tunisia wouldn't have been around to have elaborated more on that. But it's uh, but it's we have to uh, reach a point as feminist movements in MENA where we think more intersectionally. We need to reflect intersectionality into our work, into our agenda, uh, not only for just to acknowledge that these issues also exist in our societies, not only in other societies but also to understand how we can transform these power relations. Because um, to end, to have uh, gender equality, you are aspiring to end hierarchies. And hierarchies are not only gendered. You have racial hierarchies, you have religious hierarchies, you have all sorts of hierarchies. So for a true transformation, for change to occur, you need to end all forms of hierarchies. and. The, they are connected and women are not just you know their sex they're not just female they're also uh, uh, they're also all the other they're either um, identities that that impact each other and interact with systems differently so um i, I believe that we also need there also is a challenge of lack of flexibility um and that needs to be um, addressed because we the flexibility strengthens the movements. I understand that um, there are struggles and histories that we build on as, as feminists from, from um, other women before us, but it's not, it, there is nothing that is, is a constant. We need, yes, we learn from them. We, we respect their struggles, but they're not ours today. Um, and they're not going to be uh, ours tomorrow. For, for sure, the future feminists will have different agendas, will have different views. And so we need to have this flexibility to end this also intergenerational, um, I think, divide in the in the feminist movement in MENA. There is an intergenerational, uh, I, I believe, conflict uh, between um, between women and between feminists. So to, to make it stronger makes it makes us have a better chance in, in equalizing power um, and end all forms of, uh, as I said, uh, social hierarchies. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Ashna, for another a very passionate presentation um, that I think joins uh, Hibak as well in underlining how important it is to address the intersectional issues that are present here, um, as well as to acknowledge the deep, troubling historical and political roots of the current situation in many different aspects. Uh, we really feel mentioned a lot of times the shadow of colonialism, uh, these post-colonial states, um, and in the shadow of um, slavery that's just been mentioned. Um, I think there's going to be uh, a lot of questions. Um, so um, 
we can open up to questions from the audience uh, for asthma, for Hibak, also for um, Hoda Sada, who's uh, kindly willing to offer quest answer questions as well. Um, I'm just looking at the chat at the moment and somebody is asking how, how did the 2011 at US affect the Arab Spring? And who benefits from slowing the sl social transformation in the MENA? So I don't know if there's anyone who would like to try and address that question. Not at all. <laughs> but I'm not sure about the first part of the question. Not, not uh, sure. what, what does it mean if Regina could come in and- Yes, that would be helpful. I agree with you. Hi, Asma, how are you? I'm Regina and I'm from Mexico. So I'm kind of new to the, all these Arab um, ideology and everything. Like I'm, I'm like the, I've only had the American like vision, okay? So uh, you've been talking about the Arab Spring on, on 2011, but on the 2011 also happened the 9-11 and that uh, spiked uh, an anti-Arab, anti-Muslim uh, movement around the world, in my opinion, in my point of view, and from what I've learned. So, so from what I'm hearing is that this Arab Spring was meant to be like, like an awakening in these, in these countries and, and women coming, like gaining strength and everything. And, and, and I feel that after 2011, like in the United States, all those efforts were like, okay, whoop, stop it. We're going to start a war there. And, we're, and those changes are not going to happen, in my opinion, in my point of view. So who benefits from this? Like, is this colonialism, like, not wanting to leave the, 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 their colonies? Or, or, or what's happening? Like, why, when you were in this amazing movement, suddenly the Twin Towers come down and it's all the world against the Arab world? Did I make myself clear? <laughs> Sorry. A little, but I think I know that just with, would Hipak, would you like to go first though? I was, I was actually going to, to, to think Dr. Huda should go first, <laughs> but okay. you know, it's just one of those things you really ha don't have any, I don't have any answer um, that I could tell you. Uh, it's very complicated. Uh, I don't think it's, um, of course, uh, you know, um, extremism and anti-Americanism and, you know, America being anti-Muslim and, you know, uh, it became an inspiration for fundamentalist anyway. Uh, I think it was, um, I don't think it has a direct, uh, you know, uh, I don't see any connection between the revolutions and I, uh, you know, I stand to be corrected and uh, the extreme, uh, you know, what happened in 9-11. I cannot really tell you um, what the connection is, and maybe the academics, you know, would like to take this one. Um, and um, I, I honestly cannot answer. I think it's too complicated to go into, you know, what happened and how. I, I feel like America became also extremist. You know, we are extremists here, and they basically, you know, helped each other to, 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 you know, America mobilized her to be anti-Muslim. And, uh, you know, the fundamentalists basically pointed that out and it became their inspirational song, you know, that uh, the West was anti us and it made it easier for them to recruit more, you know, fundamentalists and extremists and ISIS came. And so I think for both sides to the West, for the West and, uh, and for, for the Middle East, I think it was, uh, it was the beginning of uh, the end of, uh, you know, of trust and relationships with the West. And I think I would leave it at that. Maybe Dr. Huda Sada might have uh, a better answer. <clears throat> I'm not sure about a better answer. It's a difficult question. Um, so I don't think I can, I, I don't think I will attempt to link it to 9-11, but I will say that, I mean, I will respond to who benefits. So unfortunately, who benefits first, I mean, the, 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 the first group of beneficiaries, if you like, 
are dictatorships and authoritarian regimes. I mean, we need to understand that these revolutions really shook very, you know, long lasting um, political structures that were served the interest of a small political elite. Um, definitely, and this is what we describe now as the counter revolution. I mean, they are, uh, you know, fighting very hard to um, continue their hold and control over the fate of many, many people, unfortunately. But of course, I mean, I would join Hibak in saying that, you know, you cannot, um, don't excuse the world, if you like, uh, let's call it, uh, you know, other countries, Western countries, but also other countries that have very large vested interests in and businesses with these regimes. And by continuing to support them, and giving them financial aid, they actually prolong their lives. And um, we always say that maybe if they don't, not maybe actually, if they stop getting this support from the world and from other countries, um, they will not be able to last very long. And maybe we will have an a better opportunity to overthrow these, uh, uh, you know, oppressive regimes. So it's really a combination of, it's local, but also global. Uh, forces, it's not just one group of people, um, you know. Uh, so it's very complicated, it's very complicated. It is, it really is. Yeah. And to me, I think this speaks to um, actually the exactly the panel topic of how feminism is wrapped up with identity politics and how women's rights um, in this region in particular are bound up in broader geopolitical struggles. Um, and I'm thinking about, uh, for example, um, Abu Lugard's article on do Muslim women need saving? And this trope being used as a pretext for interventions in places like Afghanistan to save Muslim women. So the perception of women's rights, I think is really important. And I think some of you have spoken towards that um, as, as well and how this can lead to internationals when there's internal opposition to uh, women achieving their rights in the region. Um, we have more questions coming in in the chat. Um, so Ali is asking if you could tell us a bit more, please, about the intergenerational divide. It's an interesting question. Um, I, 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 yeah, I will try to, uh, to also and, uh, answer that um, briefly within time. It's, uh, of course, I'm not generalizing. So the, there are organizations that are very intergenerational and have younger leadership. But in general, I think, uh, but sorry, not in general, but overall of my, of my experience um, and now moving away from being young and having younger, also <laughs> talking to younger women, uh, is that the women who are leading uh, and, and, and older women have a different um, take, I, I, as I said, on feminism, on women's rights issues. They have different approaches, which is, as I said, is understandable uh, coming from their context and time and, and also the issues that they face. Uh, but there is, um, I think, part is a cultural aspect, which is that the, the respect and putting forward the elders um, that ha that does not acknowledge to experience the, the expertise and the um, the knowledge of younger generations. So there is a lack of confidence in younger people in the Middle East, North Africa, on various issues, not only women's rights issues. And um, I see also that the younger feminists bring in more radical views uh, on, on multitude of issues that is seen sometimes by all the feminist organiz uh, organizations and leaders as, as uh, something that does not fit our context, that something is shocking, that there are still certain cultural norms that we need to respect in our societies. Uh, so that there is this, there is this uh, divide of approach and, and, and perspectives and, and unfortunately you no know, lack of conversations between us because there's no space to do that. Um, but uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, that's, the, that's my response. And it, I don't know if anyone else wants to come in on the intergenerational aspect of uh, differences between groups of feminists. So shall I come in as a member of the older generation uh, to of course. <laughs> engage in this discussion? 
Well, I, you see, I mean, I, I think I agree with Asma, but I'm going to like try and present it differently. I think this is what I try and do. So, I mean, there is absolutely no doubt that there's a new generation of young feminists who are breaking taboos that the old generation considered taboos and did not touch. And I mean, again, I, I always like to talk about this issue of sexual violence against women, which was taboo and which was one of these you know, topics that we all stayed away from. We just tried not to address it. It brought in too many, many issues and challenges and so on. So this is true. Uh, I also, I mean, there is definitely no doubt that we are in a different world. I mean, we are in the world of social media. Uh, I mean, there are so many possibilities there, but also challenges. So, I mean, there is definitely, there is, the, the world has changed and there is a new generation of young activists and feminists. This is absolutely, absolutely true. And they have more courage and they have, I don't wanna say more courage, but they definitely have more opportunities to yeah. reconnect with other groups all over the world. And this, you know, brings in a new meaning to solidarity. Now, solidarity existed before. It's not like, this is not the first time we have solidarity between groups, but definitely now, I mean, this kind of on the spot, in the, you know, the spur of the moment type of solidarity did not exist before. And all this is very empowering. Having said that, I like to think of continuities. Um, whereas I acknowledge that I mean, there will always be intergenerational you know, issues. I mean, that's, this is life, right? But, um, but I like to think of continuities. And I like to think that um, there, there are you know, certain important, if you like, um, milestones have been covered that have enabled certain discussions to happen now. And this is really what I, what I try to to do in my, my talk, you know, I start with assault police and there's, you know, and this new generation of feminists who really breaking grounds. But I really worry about um, focusing too much on how this is so new, how this is so, you know, somehow different. You know, there's a space that exists for assault police to do all this really has been paved for, I mean, we are in a different place. This is different from 20 years ago. So, so whereas I agree with Asma, absolutely, but I would just emphasize continuities mm -hmm. and how all movements are incremental, you know, one step at a time. Um, I think this could be a good moment to bring in the second part of the question, which is about intersectionality and how this has taken hold. Maybe hit that. Uh, Oh, sorry, Asma. Go ahead, Asma. I was going to invite you actually <laughs> before I do. So please go ahead. I, I, um, I, um, you know, it's it, again. I, I hate to say it's complicated because really it's the situation and the, where you live and that really influences you. And a lot of times you have to mix the old with the new. And, you know, as women activists, we're always walking in a very thin ice where we don't want to be accused moving away from who we are. But at the same time, if we are going to influence our people, we need to look like them, talk like them, understand and have the language. There are certain places that you wouldn't even dare to go. You have to always have other women who understand that community. So uh, women is, um, you know, women is movement and, uh, and, and mixing all this intersection, uh, intersectionality and all that. It's, uh, it, it's what you have to do. You can't do one thing without the other. And coming back to the uh, intergenerational, uh, you know, dialogue, and I think there's a question on that. It is not easy. I think, I, I think as older, you know, generations, I think Dr. Huda and I, of course, that generation, I think we have this parental, uh, you know, uh, relationship with younger. I certainly did at the beginning always, and things change. And every time you need to change the way you think, but there, there has to be. It's it, the role that young people can, you know, uh, you know, they can move faster. Uh, uh, I mean, faster than we did. They have more equipment. They have the social media. They're more articulate and daring because we really, in order for us to go to school, we have to negotiate. We have to negotiate with the clan, with the parents, with this, and they don't have to. It's natural to, for, to send a girl to school. So there are so many things that we went through. 
and without wisdom and understanding who you are, you really are not going to influence anyone. It will just be an indi indi individual thing. So some of what we are doing is you know, building the leadership, giving them the exposure, but they have to also understand the wisdom and the importance of having you know, the older generation also working with them. So it has to be, um, it has to be something that we can, um, you know, that we, ha they have to understand that we need each other. It's not the old way or the, or, or the right way, because the fact of the matter is, uh, they still need, if they're go they going to be talking to themselves, that's okay. But if they really want to influence at a greater level, then they need that experience and that guidance. And also the recognition of the society, because if young generations go to villages and say, okay, we're going to do this and that, villages need people who have been working with them. And sometimes it's like taking a permission. So it's complicated and you just have to be graceful and you know humble about it and all that. So sometimes we feel the aggression and all this. So there's going to be always that you know dynamic, but the fact is uh, it's very important to work together. And that solidarity between generations is very important. Culture is important, religion is important, society is important, understanding. It's not one of those things that you can just immediately attack. You don't do that. But so we have, for I think, for, for uh, Dr. Ruda's uh, generation and mine, we have learned how to navigate. Whereas young people, sometimes I feel, you know, they just go right there with all respect, of course, and appreciation. So uh, it's, uh, again, it's something that you have to really, you know, navigate and appreciate the wisdom and we need to appreciate the energy and the knowledge and, and, and all that. So, you know, this is, uh, the beat goes on. What can you do? Would you, if you like to reply? Um, because the, the, there's another question that's come in that also speaks to this more nuanced view of feminism in the region um, that, that's coming out through the discussion. Um, Matthew's asking us to talk about the need to come together as a region in the face of the challenges of inequality, uh, that gendered uh, forms of inequality. Um, and we're being asked about the role of Islamic feminism. Um, do you believe secular and Islamic feminists can unite in the face of common issues when they're based on somewhat opposing ideologies? Do you agree with the argument that utilizing largely Western feminist epistemologies is contextual? contextually inappropriate. Does this divide make it easier for elites to quash movements? Hmm. Asma, you wanted to start on that? Yeah, sure. Um, I can try. <laughs> um, I think um, I think absolutely uh, feminists of different political views and religious views could come together. There is uh, the biggest um, goal that is in common for us, which is equality, is is a, is a very much a strong bond between all of us. But how we come together is is I think the the questions that most of the Muslim feminists who are spokenly open about issues of interpretation and and text and Quranic text and, and the Hadith are based abroad or based in countries where they're not going to be prosecuted, and that is an important things to flag. While I would I love to I love to learn and read from them. I cannot bring their discourse in my own context because that's a death sentence for a lot of feminists. So I can I also cannot openly bring an, a secular perspective. <laughs> so I have to um, in 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 Libya more particularly I have to navigate much dangerous water. So it it what they the work that they do is so important um that they that they bring some that they generate knowledge and they um try to transform um, a lot of these texts that have problematic equ uh, equality issues but bring how we can bring that to our own communities without um without generating um you know conflict is is i think a discussion that i would love to have with with the Islam, with muslim feminists um absolutely i would love to learn how i could do that without endangering myself and endangering other people um and uh, but um uh, i will address the um uh, sorry was it called the feminist western feminist epistemologies yeah. well as 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 hudan hibak eloquently said about continu continuity the whole women's movement is a, is transcending um throughout history from various contexts it's not 
it's not based in the west or the east or the south it's picking up from where each has left and taking it forward localizing it or bringing it into different into different countries it's not um it's not the same thing as other political movements i would say it's not and it's not bringing something from abroad to my to my context i don't think that's uh, that's something that that messaging yes could be contextually inappropriate uh words yes but as a whole, no. Uh, I would love to hear what Hibak and what I could also would like to say about that. I will always give the, uh, you know, who the, the, you know, to speak before me. <laughs> okay, thanks Hibak. So I have to say it's so good to see you, but anyway. Um, right, uh, what do I say? So on Islamic, I mean, so, so the whole, okay, it's so the question about, um, different political ideologies coming together and the possibility of that, I really believe in the possibility of coalitions and I mean, it's almost unnatural to imagine that everybody is going to hold the same view on everything, right? So I mean, the diversity, uh, political diversity, political different ideologies is like normal human activity. So that's, I mean, that's one thing. Islamic feminism, I believe, is really an important uh, trend in um, in feminism and I really support it wholeheartedly. And I think there is a group of Islamic feminists who are producing really important knowledge that is, you know, what that contributes to what we've all been um, hoping for, which is a reformation, kind of a reformation of religious discourses, particularly in Islam. So this is a very important, and this knowledge is really, I mean, like all knowledge becomes the backbone of a strong movement. So we have different knowledges and these are all really crucial in supporting the women's movement or women's movements in different countries. Now, how do we draw on that? And this is like responding to Asma's really important question. It's really about, uh, as, as she said, I mean, what, what do we choose? I mean, at the end of the day, we all have to choose our language, what words we use, you know, what do we say when we talk? I mean, what kind of issues we bring to a particular community? I mean, these are all very, let's call them political choices. And feminism is a political movement, right? So we all, I mean, we should all be trained in that respect. And so, so the, the knowledge produced by Islamic feminists really comes in many, many levels. So I'll just cite, whereas of course there are some issues there that would, would, be, would be suicidal to addressed right now in particular contexts, you know, Arab contexts, absolutely agree there. But there are other issues. So I mean, for I'll just mention very briefly that in the early 90s, in preparation for the ICPD in Egypt, we actually, uh, we created a campaign, and Hibak will remember, to change the marriage contract in Egypt and argue for a, a no-fault divorce called Khola. Now, this was completely framed within an Islamic framework. And it worked. Now, now, this was not revolutionary in the sense that it kind of really challenged very, very you know, entrenched ideas and so on. But it was, I would argue that this was um, a, a frame which was very much within an Islamic, uh, and we used Islamic language, Islamic precedents and so on to push forward a particular uh, demand for women's rights. And it worked. So, Again, I'm just responding to what do we use and how can we perhaps draw on some of that knowledge, some of that knowledge to, uh, you know, move forward again, bearing in mind contexts and so on. Now, I mean, the point about um, the whole issue of intersectionality is really important here. And again, I want to just emphasize what Asma said about, you know, I, I, I mean, I think now looking back, it's really very difficult to talk about Western versus Arab versus South, I mean, North, South. I mean, when we look at feminisms, we talk about feminisms now, right? There's no such thing as feminism, right? And there are so many strands there. And, you know, um, women from the South have contributed to the formulation and to the advancement of feminism everywhere. So I don't think we need to be stuck in what I would describe as the moment of origin, you know? So who said what first? Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. It's really about this, you know, bringing together all of these things, very obviously taking into consideration different contexts, absolutely, but it is a transcendental, uh, sorry, transnational, transcendental is probably my wishful thinking, but it is a transnational 
movement that we're talking about. Yeah. I just want to add uh, quickly uh, to what uh, Dr. Huda and Aspa said. First of all, I don't think feminism is open for any discussion for us, but what we need to, and, and it, I never felt it was a Western idea or to, uh, I find that offensive to be honest with you. And I find it offensive when people really think feminism, there is one way of doing things, you know? What we find is like, you know, if you find someone is cooking, you know, and you come in and you say, you know, change all your ingredients. What we do is that we look at our societies and communities and work with what already they have and interweave it in these ideas. So to me, education, for example, equality, you know, women participating at the highest level and at the you know, lowest level, all that, all these questions. I think the problem comes when you get so stuck with, you know, the easymism, ism, ism, ismism or something. Yeah, feminism, this, no, it's not. It's a way of life. It's a, a state of mind. So when we stop talking about, okay, the fem Western feminists, I totally agree uh, with uh, Dr. Huda. Western feminists and Southern feminists, there's no such a thing. What does that even mean? Everyone is in their little place and they are trying to make sure that women have full equality in education, in health, in everything. That's all. So to me, that's the way. Now, there are some issues, of course, that you have to navigate and make sure that you are saying it the right you know, way and the terminology. So maybe our feminism, I think, I think the difference is because our environment determines how we do things. So there is no way we could, you know, do the same way as in the Swedish would do, or the same way that the issues, you know, we have priorities, we have this and that. It's just, it's a woman's work is never finished, it never ends, but we have to give each other the space to really, to recognize our differences, which becomes automatically our strength together. And that's all about it. Okay, thank, thank you ever so much to all of you. We have a few minutes left. Um, so we can, in less than five minutes, try to address a particularly complex uh, question that was raised by Sausan, and that is to do with the ongoing conflict situation, racism and the oppression that women face in the region. Um, so we're asked how such complex struggles can be addressed in the MENA region with limited resources and solutions within, that exist within the region, if you agree with that, of course. Well, I mean, <laughs> it, it, racism is not going to be any different from all the horrible things that have happened, except that no one has even tried to discuss it or to recognize it. So we, what, the way we have started with everything else is to start a discussion first, you know, recognize it. Because you will be surprised at how many people will be even shocked, but they will tell you, oh no, there's no problem here. So that is a good start, but there definitely, absolutely there is racism. And of course, you know, when you say, I always, uh, you know, uh, say that, you know, when you see a racist, there is also, uh, 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 you know, um, a racist is also someone who does not believe in equality for anyone, who doesn't believe in the rights of the LBG, uh, who does not believe in the rights of this and that, you know, and, um, and, and that's just the way it is. We have to start the discussion. We have to recognize it. We have to make sure we keep talking about, well, we need more democracy and more this, but then you will talk to the experts, you know, and have a discussion and the question of race will never come. Minority and minority rights and religious rights will come. But when you talk about race, I, you know, this region doesn't even think there is a race problem. So I think for a start, we need to discuss the way we had to handle it the way we have handled many problems. All the issues of women are major problems and we have, we're still trying that struggle, but we need to start that discussion. We need to open up the issue. And, and, and then change will come once people start dialogue and talking about it. I'm interested to hear Dr. Huda and Asma. Just lift your hand. Okay. Hello? Yes. Hi. Um, if I could, I'd like to respond very, very briefly because I know everybody's getting hungry to uh, made by the, uh, the question made by the, our guest from Mexico. This is about identity as well. Um, I uh, was in Bangkok when 9-11 occurred. 
And I realized at that point that, as we all did, and I'm not unique here, that there was something fundamentally wrong. And I decided that the way to address that was to change myself. And I realized that how much I had lost in my own formation by not entering the world of Islam, the Arabic uh, cultures. So I took a number of courses online, et cetera. I came back to Webster. Um, I taught uh, courses on the history of Islamic art. I'm teaching now a course on arts of the Middle East. And I'm very happy because you have been with me for the past eight weeks through my course. And now I'm glad to be with you. I'm also learning Arabic. So I wanted to make the point now to the Mexican speaker or the question she addressed. That is that our identities have all grown in this world and that the foundation of the Nina Center really began on 9-11 when I was so profoundly shaken. So I'm very glad to say that because that this, this journey that I've taken sort of kind of led me here and there and everywhere and it certainly enlarged my identity in um, inestimable and maybe transcendental ways. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, MB. I don't know if anyone wants to respond. Not at all. No, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> There's a question I would like to ask you as a um, as an engaged professor who teaches this kind of thing to our wonderful students who I love dearly. What would you like me to teach my students? What, what do you think they should know about the situation of women in the MENA region? Hoda? <laughs> yes, uh, for someone who taught for six years uh, in the UK, so I mean, so I've had that experience and I think what I, I mean, okay, my, my little experience tells me comparative perspectives. Because I found it so important for students to, to be able to see the connections and to identify as opposed to the kind of, you know, assumptions they gather from the media, for example, that somehow this is so different, this, that life is so different. And so important to remind students of the connections of how, I mean, so there is inequality, say, in Egypt or in the Arab world on a particular level, but there are so many inequalities also that they may not be aware of, or maybe they've not, they have not been as foregrounded in their own contexts. And so, you know, really highlighting these connections uh, allows students to really um, understand better, if you like, and not to think of this, of the Arab world as like this other that is so different and, you know, and we kind of have this. Anyway, so comparative perspectives, I always think is, is a good approach when teaching the Middle East. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think also it's very important to make them understand that women in this region or Muslim women in general don't need to be safe from themselves. Mm -hmm. I think this is very important because once you talk about this region, people have this idea that the media has given them that the women are down and out and, you know, and backward or whatever it is, because you have the most brilliant women, you know, in this region, because this region is not an easy region. Many of them are going through a war. So, and they are, you know, you will hear some of them today uh, speak coming from war torn countries and doing incredible, like Asma, doing incredible work. So if this world, you know, COVID now, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, academics will really make a reason, but you will find out the way the women in this region have handled that disaster is phenomenal. And the reason is because they have, many of them have to deal with so many disasters. So we have a lot to learn from each other, you know, on an equal basis. And I think this is so important. I could not agree with you more. And uh, the particularity of, teaching where I do is that it is so multicultural and half the women in my class can be Muslim women, some of whom come from those circumstances and are incredibly resilient and inspiring and humbling. And my thought with a question related to limitations of a region is the opportunities, is the courage, the resilience, the work. Um, so we can look at it from as that aspect too. Asma, is there anything you wanted to add as well? Sorry. 
Um, no, just that um, I, I think uh, also there is um, students have to to learn about women in the region uh, through their agency, um, not to dehumanize them, not to belittle them, uh, and not to um, learn from them on them through other scholars. Uh, read for local researchers, encourage local research, uh, amplify voices of, of younger researchers and, and, uh, and, and university students. Host sometimes the students in, in one of the classes and let them speak to the, to the class. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to add. Okay, I think on this, um, I want to leave it there with the voice and um, yeah, of women from the region. I, we can't, I think we can't leave it on a better note than that. Um, other than to thank uh, warmly uh, Asma Khalifa, Ibakos Men and Hoda Sada, thank you so much for your contributions. Um, and um, wishing everybody a bon appétit and all the best for the continuation of the event. Thank you very much. Thank you again to this last panel. I'd like to announce that we're going to lunch in the cafeteria and we'll be back at two o'clock. So please enjoy your lunch. Bon appetit and see you later. <laughs>